dominance in the dome. The Saints run over Tampa Bay for their sixth straight win. We'll show you what went right Sunday. Plus, why LSU wasn't disappointed after their seventh straight loss to Alabama. Nationally, fewer kids are playing high school football. We'll tell you why that's not the case in South Louisiana. And we'll take a look at our top local seeds with the prep football playoffs starting this weekend. Tonight on Fourth Down. This is the last word on sports. Fourth Down on Four starts now. Expect the national bandwagon jumping to begin soon. No doubt at the halfway point in their season, the Saints are Super Bowl contenders. I'm Doug Mouton. Welcome to Fourth Down on Four. Right now, maybe six teams can say they're legitimately in the hunt in the NFC. The Saints positively are after blowing out Tampa Bay in the Superdome, as Ricardo LeCompte reports. <laughs> Complimentary football. The Saints preach that phrase constantly, and the message was received today. Contributions from all three phases, and it started with special teams. <laughs> Rookie Justin Hardy blocked a first quarter punt and returned it seven yards for New Orleans' first special teams touchdown since 2015. Still can't believe in myself. Like in my head right now, I, I feel like I got a block. I don't even realize that I have a touchdown yet. It haven't hit me yet. I don't know when it will, but, uh, but it's just about remaining humble because, like I said, next week I want another one, and if not, I want a big play. I, whatever I can do to help this team win, I'm willing to do. The complimentary football continued with the defense. The unit disrupted and harassed the Bucks' offense all game long. The fourth-ranked O in the NFL in total offense coming into the game only managed 200 yards against the Saints' D. The Saints even knocked out Tampa quarterback Jameis Winston from the game. As long as we're catching these wins, as long as we're affecting the quarterback, as long as we're hitting quarterbacks, as long as we're, you know, affecting passer, running back, everything. Um, we talk about hits, hurries, disruptions. As long as I'm still effective, as long as I still think that I'm probably the top defensive end, and I probably thought that since I entered the league, but, you know, now you, there's some analytics that can back that up. At this, at this day and age, all I care about is these wins and cultivating our D-line to be better than what we were last week. Just as a unit, the whole D-line, I think we're starting to come together, man. Our uh, coach preached the last night about how we need to come together more, you know, just enjoy each, enjoy, enjoy each other's play on the field more, and that's what we're doing. The secondary, particularly Marshawn Lattimore, held leading receiver Mike Evans to just one catch for 13 yards. And maybe that frustration boiled over in the second half when he landed this cheap shot on Lattimore after the rookie and Winston were going at it on the sideline. That was a sneak, a sneak move. Don't nobody respect that. So you know how to retaliate. You know, it, all the talk in this football, you know, it, it happens. But as soon as you put, put your hand on me, you know, it is different. That's how you retaliate to that on the field. You know, we're we not on the streets, you know. So all that, that fake tough stuff, that, that, don't, that don't get nobody hype. You know what I'm saying? That, that just, it is what it is. You know, we're we going we gonna to guide them on the field, you know, making plays against them, you know. I know it went to New York to look at, and that if there's not an ejection in that situation, then I don't know what that when there's supposed to be an ejection. So he was a little angry. 13 years. That incident happened in the third quarter, with the Saints leading 30 to three, and that lead highlights the play of the offense. The O began rolling with the touchdown scoring drive in the two-minute drill just before the end of the first half. It was capped with an impressive 33-yard run after catch by rookie Alvin Kamara. The O-line did a great job. They, they were able to get out there and, and pick up some blocks and then, you know, I'm just trying to bob and weave and get in the end zone. I was smelling it, so I'm happy I was able to get that one. The duo of he and Mark Ingram ran all over the Bucks to begin the second half. The Saints' opening drive led to a Kamara touchdown run to push the advantage to 23-3. The running back tandem combined for 231 yards from scrimmage. Meanwhile, Drew Brees threw for 263 yards and two scores his second one to Ted Ginn Jr. after the Saints forced a Tampa Bay turnover. The complimentary football leads to a 30-10 win over a division rival. A sixth straight win for the Saints, and now they've established themselves as a serious contender in the league, and history actually backs that up. The Saints become just the third team in the Super Bowl era to start a season 0-2 and then reel off six straight wins afterwards. The other two teams, the 93 Cowboys and the 2007 Giants, ended up winning the Super Bowl. Now, don't book those Super Bowl flights just yet, but still a great spot to be in midway through the season. Well, division wins are great. Um, obviously, those, those, uh, those are very important. But um, 
I, mean, I think each each week it's you know we really just try to look at it as you know it's a faceless opponent. It's you know, we're still striving to play striving to play our best game, um, and I don't think we've achieved that yet. We're continuing to make strides in the right direction, but um, there's still a lot of things that we can do better. The road only gets tougher. Reporting at the Superdome, Ricardo Lacombe, fourth down on four. All right, thanks, Ricardo. And how's this for a stat? From the NFL, Drew Brees now has 225 TD passes at the Mercedes-Benz Superdome. That's the most in NFL history by a quarterback at a single stadium. He is loving the Superdome. Back to Ricardo Lecomte now with some analysis after the game. Joining us now is Joel Erickson from The Advocate. Saints win again. Can we actually now say that this defense is for real? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they've, they've, during the win streak, they've gotten some teams that have been struggling on offense. The one thing the Bucks were doing well was playing offense, especially th throwing the football. You know, they came in number two in the league in passing offense, and for all intents and purposes, the Saints completely shut them down. They knocked Jameis Winston out of the game with that injured shoulder. But before that, he wasn't doing anything anyway. I think he finished with 67 yards. They had like 113 yards overall. This is the, over the last six games, this is one of the best pass defenses in the NFL, and that's something I don't think any of us expected when the season started. It's crazy. The Tampa Bay came in this as the fourth-ranked team in the NFL in, in total yards. Mm -hmm. um, so this was a very – so th if, if anything, this was the first test that we really got to see, all right, are the Saints defense, can they handle an offense that could be potent? And they surely did that today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they – they caught Matt Stafford at a time when he was injured and the Lions were struggling. They, they, they caught Green Bay when they didn't have Aaron Rodgers. I know Jameis Winston has a shoulder injury, but they had still put up, three, he still had thrown for 384 yards against Buffalo two weeks ago. And, and that, you know, this, this time, this, they just never got anything going. Their only touchdown was because Willie Sneed dropped a punt. Uh, and the other thing is, when this defense gets going, man, the dome was insanely loud today. And you start to see the effects of that on the other team. They had a, they had a two penalties in a row at one point, and both of them seemed like crowd noise penalties. So uh, it, it's amazing, but this defense is really kind of driving this team right now. You're right, that atmosphere here today. I think that's, you know, I've only been here for a few games, but still that was the loudest I've heard it mm -hmm. uh, so far. Uh, offensively, it, it's kind of weird because we're seeing, we're seeing the identity of this offense, and it's not Drew Brees anymore. Well, it starts with the running game. Drew was very efficient to open the game. They did come out throwing, uh, but there were some mistakes there early on. They had some mistakes. Uh, the first drive ended in a field goal. They had the fumble, and the and then they, they finally got going. And it was it was again. It was the running game. They started blowing open holes. Uh, that's really what started going. And I, I think the running back specifically, Mark Ingram, Alvin Kamara, that duo has become borderline unstoppable over the. Now, Tampa is not a good defense, but we've already seen them do this against good defenses. And so you can go, this is just a continuation of what we've been seeing during this win streak. And we talk about this win streak, it's now up to six. I know I've asked you this before, okay, is this, is this a turning point for the Saints? Is this, is this, are we like, all right, finally, we can give them credit. Is, is this the moment where we're kind of going, you know what, this team may actually be one of the elite teams in the NFC, if not the NFL. I, I, think, I think this was the performance you were waiting to see, a dominant performance. I mean, they made mistakes, there was too many special teams mistakes after the uh, block kick by Justin Hardy uh, there was the fumble but 200 yards for a Tampa Bay offense that had been able to pile up yards going into it uh, the offense got going and rolled over the P Tampa Bay defense this was a pretty complete and dominant win and, and those are the kinds of things that you see from teams who are contenders in the NFC and and at six and two it doesn't matter what it looks like that's that's what you are at this point your record you are what your record says you are and the record says the Saints are pretty good Pretty good, another impressive performance as he beat Tampa. Joel, appreciate your insight. All right, thanks, Ricardo. Coming up, LSU outgained Alabama and did a lot of things well, even though they lost. How they say they'll use their experience in Tuscaloosa moving forward. And later, local high school football coaches talk about how they've changed to meet growing concerns about concussions and why they believe participation numbers are not a problem here on fourth down on four. For the seventh straight time Saturday night, Alabama beat LSU, but this loss didn't feel as demoralizing, maybe because LSU was a 21 point underdog and played better than expected. When it was over, Ed Ogeron said there's a lot of believe in that locker room right now. The Tigers were closer to Alabama in another loss to the Crimson Tide. I believe in more victories to a certain extent, but, um, you know, we, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, we have to win. 
Uh, so, I mean, we did we did a lot of things well, so we have a lot to be proud of. What we doing over here is special with Coach O, and uh, y'all saw that tonight. We fought for 60 minutes. Uh, like I said, we didn't get the W, but we'll be back. LSU actually outgained Alabama, and if a couple of their deep shots had worked, we kept on coming after them, you know, and uh, you know, we got to look at the film. If the ball was on the throne or not, I got a couple of them on the money, some on the throne, but you know, if we could have connected on those, it would have been a different game. But you know what? Hey, you play a team that's eight no, a team that's won championships, it can't be, it can't be if you're just going to make those plays. Quarterback play really told the tale. Danny Etling made one bad mistake, which Alabama turned into a touchdown. We are throwing a little out route to Darius. And that was critical. That was a critical in, in the ball game. I got to look at the film, got to talk to Matt. I'm sure that the throw wasn't correct, but uh, we got to see. Meanwhile, just like last year, Jalen Hurts made enough plays with his legs to win. I mean, he's a running back that can throw the ball, like I said before the game. So, I mean, you just got to stay in your rush lane. So when he scrambled, everybody got to be right there and contained. And, you know, he's just going to run into an LSU player. So I, I don't really know yet because I know we was all over the field when he was scrambling. So, I mean, somebody probably came out their rush lanes, but we had a great plan. You know, shout out to Coach Randy. He had a great plan to keep him in check. And we did that for most of the part. For the most part, but Hurts did enough. I thought that our guys up front played very well. Uh, they felt confident the whole game, which is struggling in coverage, which I was surprised. We've done a good job in coverage, but we did not do a good job tonight. Ogeron said he thought LSU's inability to cover Calvin Ridley and company made the difference because LSU was not dominated up front, as many expected, even with two true freshmen on the offensive line. No, I wasn't surprised. You know, we, we, we have a standard of, of the team, of the offensive line room, of the, of the offense, and those guys meet the standard. You know, they, they wouldn't be out there if they didn't. So, you know, I, I feel like that they were really prepared and they played well. With three very winnable SEC games to go, there's plenty to build on for LSU. <laughs> And we ain't backing down. And it starts with the rest of this year. You know, we got three big games, uh, three SEC games that we want to win. We want to finish this thing strong. And uh, we coming. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we got a brotherhood right now that nobody can break. And, you know, the coaches, they put us in the right position, and we just sticking together. We have a more electric team now. You know, I, I feel like our team is, you know, we're, we're go-getters now. And, um, you know, how, how he said, we're coming. And uh, you know, we're not going to let something like this uh, uh, knock our spirits down and knock us, knock us off track. Uh, we're just trying to stay on that track and, and, and keep trucking uphill. Let's go, man. Let's go. Let's go. A 10-win season is still possible in year one of the O era after an encouraging loss in Tuscaloosa. And here are those final three regular season games. Arkansas at 11 a.m. in Tiger Stadium Saturday. The Razorbacks have been a disaster. Then at Tennessee the following week, the Volunteers have been a disaster. And finally, a home game against Texas A&M. The Aggies have been okay this season. LSU should be favored in all three of those games. If they could win them all and a bowl game, that would be 10 wins, which would be a terrific season for Ed Ogeron and the Tigers. Channel 4 Morning Show anchor Leslie Spoon was back in sports this weekend covering LSU and Alabama, and Leslie got some analysis for us afterwards. Leslie. Joined now by Glenn Gilbo with Gannett, Louisiana, and LSU outgained Alabama, <laughs> rushed for 151 yards against the number one run defense in the nation. They just couldn't get it in the end zone. Yeah, the, the key was when they got down there when it was 14 nothing. if they could have put a touchdown right there. But, you know, compared to the last two games, I mean, they really moved Alabama's defensive line around. They were consistently moving the ball. You know, they didn't, they didn't score much, but baby steps, you know. I mean, I, I think that's a step in the right direction. They said this week, of course, that's Alabama's the reason Ed Ogeron hired Matt Canada, and they had some deep shots. They had some opportunities. What did you think about the play calling? I, I thought it was good. I mean, they, they kept Alabama guessing a little bit. I mean, just judging from what Coach Saban said after the game, he, he's not used to going against this type of offense. And they had two weeks to prepare for it. If, if they wouldn't have had this open week, that's what they ought to get rid of is the open week. 
and they'd have had a much better chance. But I think it's it's good for the future that they have a different offense now because it, 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 it helped. Now, the defense played great. Offense still has to get a lot better. Defense forced a lot of three and outs, and the offense didn't take advantage of it. But LSU's played Alabama as well or better than anyone else this season. You said the defense played great. They did look good, but Jalen Hurts has really just been the difference in this game the past two years. Yeah, the, the, the running quarterback, LSU, can't quite handle sometimes, but, but really, uh, I think the defense played almost well enough to win. A little more offense, and it, it, it could have been different. Uh, and, you know, just some more strikeability by the offense, and, and it could have been different. Of course, they lost 24 to 10. It was a 21, they were 21 point underdogs. Talking to the players after the game, they didn't really seem too shocked that they lost. They seemed like it was just kind of a step in the right direction. Do you think that's okay that seven straight losses to Alabama? Well, I think the, the way that everybody thought they were going to get killed in this game, I, I think that's a little measure of, of something to be proud of that, that that didn't happen. But I did notice LSU didn't call any timeouts down the last few minutes of the game, you know, try to throw it up there, score do an onside kick so I think maybe they were happy with with the score you know I mean you got you know, beggars can't be choosy I mean they've lost Alabama so much now at least they they got a decent game out of it and that's and that's two in a row but but this game was better than last year's 10 nothing loss because the offense actually moved Alabama's defense around a little bit Glenn thank you so much sure Doug back sure. to you all right, thanks, Leslie. Still ahead, we'll look at the top local seeds with the prep playoffs starting this weekend and why coaches believe Louisiana is bucking the national trend in high school football. That's ahead on 4th and on 4. The number of kids playing high school football in America is down about 2%. That's according to the National Association of all those state athletic associations. The primary reason, parental concerns over concussions. The numbers are down nationwide, but that's not the case around New Orleans. This is McDonough 35's football practice. Right there. And participation is not a problem. We got 90 kids out for football. No, I got the hug. Numbers is growing, and right now, like uh, at 35, we don't have enough uniform. And that's not really an issue. It just means they've never had this many kids playing high school football. And his team is loaded. In many ways, this is the golden age of New Orleans public school football. Last season, both Carr and Landry Walker won state championships. They're both terrific again this season. So is Warren Easton and Carver and McDonough 35. Public school now in the city is on a roll, I tell everybody. And Wayne Reese would know. He's coached at Orleans Parish Schools for 45 years now. He says they are very aware of the concussion issue and they don't ignore it, just the opposite. Kutri says they're able to get ahead of the concussion question with parents by meeting with them through a program sponsored by Tulane where they address the concerns and what they're doing to limit concussions. He said equipment is far better than it's ever been before, and he says they teach tackling differently. You're never going to hit anybody head on, and you're not going to drop your head, and all these kind of things. That would bring that concussion on and everything. And then we're not going to put uh, bigger kids against smaller kids. Right there, right there, right there. Right Do you think this generation today will have less head injuries than people our age? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. You know, I just think it's because it's, it, it's in the forefront. And every coach we talk to believes going forward, the number of recurring head injuries will decrease, largely because kids aren't running the ball or tackling with their heads down anymore. High school football practices look a lot different than they did 20 years ago, with significantly less hitting. And as Wayne Reese said, the number of kids playing in public schools is not down. It's also not down in private schools around New Orleans. Jesuit coach Mark Sanji says his numbers remain consistent. The same is true in Metairie at Rummel, where Jay Roth has not seen a drop in participation. I haven't seen it. No. I mean, if you're at Rummel and you have athletic ability, you're playing football. I mean, that's just, and kids want to play. <laughs> And the kids certainly want to play in the River Parishes. Longtime Destrahan coach Stephen Robichaux says his participation numbers haven't really changed in 25 years. The question is, why? Why are some parts of the country seeing a drop while South Louisiana isn't? 
I just think it's the culture. It, it's, you know, it, it's South Louisiana, it's football, it's the Death Strand Hornville game. It, it's, it's, everybody wants to be a part of something, and the community's involved here. Cornette, Louisiana produces the highest number of NFL players per capita of any state. Football is just ingrained in the culture. It is Landon Collins for the fourth straight game. It's just who we are. And the prep playoff brackets are out. We have seven local schools who are seated either first or second in their divisions. The ones in 4A, the defending state champs from Edna Carr, they are first in a stacked 4A bracket. In 1A, West St. John is seated first. The Rams are 7-2 and two overall, but unbeaten against other 1A schools. And on the private school side, the unbeaten De La Salle Cavaliers are the top seeds in Division II. Covington, Lakeshore, John Curtis, and Newman are all two seeds in their respective classes. We're back with more fourth down on four in a minute. Stay with us. Inside LSU football is next, and then Tulane football with Coach Willie Fritz. Another hour of football still to come. For Andrew Doak, Ricardo LeCompte, producer Danny Rockwell, photographer Adam Nay, and all of us here at Eyewitness Sports, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on fourth down on four.